If you're a pop culture junkie who loves TV, film, music, comedy, and other really important stuff, then you've come to the right place. Get ready and settle in for Classic Conversations, the best pop culture interviews in the world. That's right, we circled the globe so you don't have to. If you're ready to be the king of the water cooler, then you're ready for Classic Conversations with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. All right, Jane, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. You get the show going each and every week, and this week was no exception. Welcome, everybody, to episode 305 of Classic Conversations. As always, I am your host, Jeff Duoskin. Get ready for the most Connecticut-focused episode in our four-year history. My guest today is actor and author Ileana Douglas. We're diving deep into her book, Connecticut in the movies from dream houses to dark suburbia. You're going to love this conversation and that's coming up in just a few seconds. And in these few seconds, do not miss my conversation with Leah Rudick from last week, viral sensation and hilarious comedian. But right now you loved her in Goodfellas, Cape Fear, Action, Connecticut's own Ileana Douglas. Enjoy. All right, everyone. I'm excited to introduce my next guest, actress. Writer, producer, director, author of I Blame Dennis Hopper and the book we're going to dive in today, Connecticut in the movies. Welcome to the show, the amazing Ileana Douglas. Thank you. Thank you for that burst of vocal applause. (laughs) Um, So, so, all right. So here's my attempt to Connecticut impress you. Okay. If it falls flat, we'll just, I'll edit it out. But here's my attempt to Connecticut impress you. Your favorite. Pepe, Sally's, Sally's, or modern pizza, favorite pizza? It's almost impossible. They're all good for, first of all, it is better than New York pizza. They're all great, and they vary in very subtle ways. But New Haven pizza, for people that don't know, it's coal-fired. None of that California wood fire. We use coal, and it gives it a distinctive char around the edge. Pepe's is famous for its white sauce with clams. Sally's, I'm not sure Sally's has a very specific kind of pizza with potatoes on it. I think um, Sally's is a little more tomato forward, and uh, I'm not as familiar with modern, but it's between Sally's and Pepe's. I would have also accepted Mystic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, or but it's almost impossible to have bad pizza. That is true. I have a friend, a dear friend, he lives in Connecticut. He's like, oh, I'm two, two towns away. Ask her about pizza. Oh, that's so funny. They, they talk a lot about pizza here. It's so funny. Now they're going to be talking about movies and pizza. Your new book, Connecticut in the Movies, it's a love letter to movies and Connecticut. I want to get into that. But I do want to kind of just say off the bat that you kind of got me obsessed with like digging into Connecticut. I love it. And digging into, I'm from Michigan. So, you know, just outside of Detroit. So I started looking into all the movies and stuff that were made in Michigan. Thank you. That That's what I wanted. I Anybody can do this about their own state. Movies do, especially in the past, certainly represent our, cult- our culture. And you learn so much about the history of your state through these different films. I did. And you could do that with different states, you know, the movies about the Midwest or Vermont, I guess. But I felt like that Connecticut was so undervalued in terms of its cinematic contributions. And I'd always sort of felt that way. And then as I started digging in and writing about it, I I realized, oh, it actually is. Look at all these genres of films that nobody has ever written about, you know, the 60s sex comedies, horror films comedies from the 1930s that are all conveniently placed in Connecticut. Eugene O'Neill wrote about London. So it's just an homage to all the great films that were put here all in one book, one after another after another. I'm a little pedantic trying to prove my point. Like, look at all these great movies and all the variety. But it is a love letter to the state, hopefully. No, it is. I, uh, it was very informative. I like the way you, you broke it out and you did it. And like I said, it, it inspired me to kind of figure out more. And I, was I love like, that. And it was cool to like 
in the context of the Connecticut world that you were building just to see like, oh, Crystal Skull, you know, like like all these movies that, oh yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah, okay. You know, so like you start seeing all the connections that you mentioned in the book because there's so many. I imagine there were so many you had to leave out. Yeah, there's many I left out because again, it's not, and I watched a ton of movies and I just, you know, what is my criteria? I have my own eclectic, which I write about in the, in the introduction. This is a, you're taking a cinematic road trip with me through the state. So these are my personal favorite films that I think tell the story of Connecticut, of its people and of its history and how its perception has some, has been correct and how sometimes it's, you know, kind of wildly wrong. But there are the people that say, oh, you didn't put Beetlejuice in. And you can't, first of all, it was made in Vermont. And this is precisely why I didn't put movies in that in, because it's a deflection of what the book is about. Just because they say Connecticut, but the movie is filmed in Vermont, and actually most of it's on a soundstage, it doesn't fall into what I really consider to be a Connecticut movie. And the book is, I break it up with funny you know, lighthearted moments, or there's a whole chapter on Connecticut cameos, you know, where, for instance, there's a Barry Levinson movie called What Just Happened. The entire film was made in Connecticut, but it takes place in Hollywood. So it's like a bizarro Connecticut cameo. And so that fits in for me, my eclectic taste, I guess. So that's in, that's there in the film. And Barry Levinson lives in Connecticut. So therefore, it's all little hidden little things that I put in. In that chapter, you also talk about It's a Wonderful Life. Yes. And so every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. That is from Connecticut. Well, now I'll never... Seven bells. Yeah, I didn't know that until I was started, comb again, combing through these movies. I had never once in any book heard anything that the bell, whole big thing in the movie of him getting his wings and that the bell is from Bevan's Bells, which is in a town called East Hampton, Connecticut, which once boasted so many bell factories that it was called Belltown. And it's still called Belltown today, although the only remaining factory is Bevan's Bells. They're still in business. Wow, that is a uh, didn't expect a bell story. You never know what you're going to get when you're doing these great these interviews. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. You know, it's a road trip. Yeah, the Cannonball Run started in Connecticut. A mighty wind took place there. So we have these little, yeah, you have these little like, no, I didn't know that. But then there are big glaring ones that I just, I just didn't put in just to be contrary and have people. <laughs> Why didn't you include that? Because it's, I didn't want to, or I didn't. Sometimes there were certain movies. I just didn't, if I don't like the movie, I find it very hard. I can't just include the movie just because, and then there's this. Because I'm not that kind of a, a writer. It's more polite to just not include it for various reasons. And that's that's what I did. Every film that is in the book is a movie that I truly feel deserves a second look. Yeah, there was um there was definitely the one that I wrote down that I wanted to dig into myself. Hang on, I wrote it down. Oh, I'm curious now. The one where he pretends to be Jewish to uh Oh. Oh my God, never seen Gentleman's Agreement? Gentleman's Agreement, thank you. No, no, I was like, oh my God, I've heard of it. I was like, oh, I got to see this. Gentleman's Agreement is not only a great film, it's something, you know, in my day, they don't do, teachers used to actually show movies to kids with sort of moral, that we'd have discussions. There was a, you know, we I remember we watched a film called The Oxbow Incident, which is about a man who's wrongly accused of a crime and hung by fellow citizens. And, you know, they used to cut, I don't know who did it, but someone in the film industry used to have edited versions of films, you know, that were maybe 45 minutes long. And you'd watch them in school and have a discussion about it. But Gentleman's Agreement was filmed in 1947. Uh, Ilya Kazan is just an extremely important film in terms of America. It's about restrictive covenants that were started in Darien, Connecticut, to keep out Blacks and Jews and the reporter. And it was written by a woman who was Jewish, who assimilated and didn't want anyone really to know that she was Jewish. So it, you know, so she's a Connecticut author. The book takes place in Connecticut, in Darien. And Gregory Peck is the main, the star of the film. And what I write about it is at the time in the 40s, 
his own agent didn't even want him to be in the movie. It was that much of a hot topic. And Daryl Zanuck, who was the producer, who was not Jewish, he was the only person who would take on the subject matter. And it's something, what is so important about the film, it's not about blatant bigotry. It's about people that are afraid to speak up, that don't want to rattle the neighbors, that think they're basically nice, good people, but turn the other way when bad things are happening. And so you can't look at the film without sort of examining your own path, examining what could I do better, et cetera. It's it's an incredible film. It handles both blatant bigotry, but then, as I said, kind of bigotry that you don't know you have when somebody tells a joke and it's a little off-putting, but you don't say anything because you you don't you're trying to fit in. So I and I think that there's that aspect of it. Book you know covers both idyllic Connecticut and then you know bad dark things that happen in suburbia. And this is one of one of the darkest periods. One of many thanks to you that'll be on my list. Somebody at Amazon's gonna be like, why where's all these uh, 399 charges going? <laughs> 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 yeah, well it's it was, you know, in writing about in gentlemen's agreement, I discovered that even though again the movie came out in 1947 and won Best Picture and won all this acclaim. It actually wasn't until 1968 with the Fair Housing Act that some of these covenants were finally defeated. And in some places, again, there's that subtle feeling that it still is going on. Gentlemen, it's a, it, what a great title, Gentlemen's Agreement. You know, it's just a subtle underhand agreement that we don't really know about that is going to keep out the wrong type of people, whoever they are. In the same book, this is why it was a very important movie to add, even though it's a more contemporary movie, but along the same lines, terrific film directed by Ernest Dickerson for Showtime called Good Fences, which is about a Black family in the 1960s who moved to Connecticut and try to assimilate and are not accepted in their own neighborhood. And it's this whole thing about, again, this wanting this upward mobility in Connecticut. And it's terrific film. It sort of turns a little bit into a horror movie towards the end, which I wasn't really crazy about the ending. But up until then, it is a really unexpected, satirical look at, at a Black family trying to move to Connecticut. It's a terrific film. Terrific. All right. Another one. <laughs> yeah, that's, there's that's so many. Whoopi, that's we, Whoopi Goldberg, right? Yeah, Whoopi Goldberg and uh, Danny Glover, who's always terrific. And Monique. 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 There's a, yeah, she's incredible in the film. This is way before Precious. She moves in the, they're this, you know, Black family living in Connecticut. And then Monique wins the, it's so great and satirical. Monique wins the lottery and she moves in next door. And Whoopi Goldberg is thrilled because she's got like a friend now and somebody to talk to. She doesn't feel so alone. She's not the only, they're not the only black family. And her husband, Danny Glover, it's the same thing that happens in Gentleman's Agreement. He doesn't want her to be friends with her because she's not the right, it's not the right kind of friendship that she wants. And Whoopi Goldberg is trapped. Like, again, it's, it's the black perspective on white suburbia. So it's terrific, terrific film. They should re-show all of these films so I could get to talk about them because they're all, and they all take place in Connecticut. So that's what was fascinating to me. You go, well, which is the real Connecticut? Is it is it this? Is it Good Fences? Is it Gentleman's Agreement? Or is it Christmas in Connecticut? You know, how can one small state have this much diversity? I, I find that to be fascinating. It's a goldmine. Do you think cinema kind of focused on Connecticut, but you know, that that is true in a lot of places. Yeah, very much so. And again, I don't really know why, but got its proximity to New York, but so does, you know, Westchester and so does New Jersey, but why, you know, so when they were making good fences, they could have gone to used an upwardly mobile area in Westchester, but what is it about Connecticut? You know, it was something about the shorthand of like, yeah, it just works better. Just work in it. It just somehow, it just sort of works better in a lot of these cases. You know, I don't really know why that that was, I guess that was the, you know, the riddle I was trying to solve with the movie. Like how could one state be, and I use this example in the book, 
Alfred Hitchcock, the movie Rope, which is about the Leopold and Loeb murders, which are two students from Chicago who murdered their classmate. Well, in Rope, he changes the location to New York City, and there are the two guys go to Yale. The one guy comes from a very wealthy Connecticut family, and so Connecticut is mentioned quite a bit. And so I I delve into well, why did why wasn't it Chicago? What was it about? What was the shorthand for Hitchcock that we could believe it was a little more sinister to have some wealthy old money guy from Connecticut be this, you know, this cold blooded killer? And but yet it does. It works. I hate to say it. It works a little better. The whole beginning of the movie, the movie opens with them murdering their friend, really ghastly. And then they they have buried they have put the body temporarily in. They're hiding it temporarily, like right plain sight under this table setting. And they keep almost braggadocia. They keep saying, we're going to go up to Connecticut for a few weeks. And we know we've heard off camera them talking that the plan is they're going to bury the body at their mother's country estate in Connecticut. Why was that better than going to the countryside of Chicago? I guess maybe that just seems sort of more ordinary. I know you're from Connecticut, so this answer won't resonate with you. But maybe it's just because when you think of Connecticut, I don't think anything good. I don't think anything bad. So you can just frame how I feel about Connecticut by just yeah. making it yeah. part of the plot. Yeah, exactly. You could, you know, you could use, you know, both. you could use it for anything. And now I theorize in the book, it begins really with the Stepford Wives, is that after the Stepford Wives, shorthand for something really bad is going to happen to these people, have them go to Connecticut. Because we did something like just really, you know, the minute they get in the car and they start driving towards Connecticut, we go, "Uh oh, something's going to be bad. Their their house is going to be haunted or something really horrible is going to happen to these people. And that sort of really, really began with the Stepford Wives. And we haven't really escaped that. We've been sort of painted with that brush and part of the book too was to was to dis, you know kind of dismiss that as hey we're so much more than you know Stepford Wives and Mystic Pizza. I mean, let's not get crazy. More than <laughs> Mystic Pizza. <laughs> it was great to re-examine Mystic Pizza again, not just as '80s rom com and Julia Roberts, you know, big sort of debut into stardom is. I point of view I had was really that it was about another area in Connecticut that we don't talk about too much, which is Stonington and Groton and Mystic, which is where all the Portuguese fishermen were and and how big the fishing community is in Connecticut. Again, it's something nobody, when we think of lobster and things like that, we really think of Maine, but Connecticut is right on the Long Island Sound and, and fishing and New London is a really major, major part of Connecticut and sea, sea life, seamen, captains, you know, going back. So that, again, is a whole nother area of Connecticut nobody ever had talked about. So that was my approach in, in Mystic Pizza. Yeah, you got me thinking about lobster when I was reading that. There was a quote, I even <laughs> wrote down a quote, is that don't get between a woman and her lobsters. From uh, It happened yes. to Jane. Right. It happened to Jane. It's another it's terrific. And that's an example of a movie that is about how idyllic everything is. It's shot in a very small town of Chester that is a snapshot of the past, and it remains that way today. Somehow this town has been kind of untouched by anything commercial. And even within the telling of the film, within the film, there was a joke. Well, it stars Doris Day and Jack Lemmon, director is Richard Quine. And Richard Quine discovered the town just by driving out of New York and went into this town, said, this is it. This is where I want to shoot my movie. And they all lived in the town, which you wouldn't think of a big studio movie from the 50s, inhabiting the small town and having neighbors come over and bring them food and jam. And they all fell in love with Chester, so much so that one of the actors, Max Showalter, ended up buying a house and living there for the rest of his, of his life. But the whole idea of the movie, which is this woman is, you know, the bad the evil train guy has shut down the, the train to her small town, and now she can't, she has no way to, to sell her lobsters. And the whole town gets together, and they fight this capitalist, and in the end, they win. And the whole movie, the making of the film, was exactly like the movie. And that 
really, really fascinated me. So they were using local artisans to build the props and the, the entire town is in the film, you know, in the background. And it's just really fun like to see their Cub Scouts kids local you still meet people to this day my neighbor was like i knew the guy who built the train and you know all all, everybody because it was so exciting to have a big hollywood movie here so that stands out again as the best of what connecticut can be you know yankee ingenuity i have to say i haven't been to maine but to your point i want to go to maine because in my mind it's the land of lobster and i can eat all the lobster i want even though I grew up Jewish, that's still a dream of mine. And I love it. <laughs> but now in, in this book, and then you just saying what you were just saying about Connecticut, now I'm thinking, oh, maybe, maybe there's an alternative here. <laughs> yes. Unintended side effect of your book. But there we are. Let me ask you a question. I dug into Michigan. You're dug into Connecticut. I know you're like you're a movie expert, historian, all that kind of good stuff. Are there any states where a movie hasn't taken place? Oh gosh. That's a tough question. I'm sure there are. I don't know if I can think of any you now off the top of my head of whether they really, I mean, obviously the Midwest and Nebraska quite a bit, Iowa. It's a good question. Florida, I know there's been movies in Florida. Maine, I think of Stephen King, Misery. Sure, sure. I'm sure there's one that we don't. I did a movie in Hawaii. <laughs> there you go. I'm sure there's been movies in Puerto Rico and San Juan. I was just curious if there's a poor state that sits there and they're Googling and they're like, sorry, Google says, sorry, you should move. (laughs) There probably is one. I mean, obviously states, certain states, Georgia is used quite a bit. Mm -hmm. It's no Connecticut. It's no Connecticut. You know, that would be an interesting theory. I don't know. I mean, except for New York and LA. Uh, To me, Connecticut has such a fascinating, I don't think there's any other state that has this many of a variety of films all made in one state. We've got uh, Detroit has Robocop, True Romance. <laughs> yeah, and you have the uh, that great documentary about the musician, Sugar Man. Oh, oh, Search, yeah, he just passed away in Search of Sugar Man. What yeah. a great documentary that is. Would that be considered a Detroit movie? Are we counting documentaries? What was your Connecticut code for the book when it came to documentaries? I did not do any documentaries, yeah. That's like I a different did. genre because that's specific, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, at a certain point, you have to stop. <laughs> right, right, right. That's what I'm saying. You had a code. You know, it becomes diluted, but I could always do a secondary volume and include documentary. Oh, so the, the other piece of Mystic Pizza trivia that I got from your book, first screen appearance of Matt Dillon. Uh, Matt, Matt Damon. Matt Damon. First screen appearance of Matt Damon. When yes. I edited it, I'll have said it right. The yes. uh, I wrote it down. Yeah. Damon sounds better. Sorry to interrupt, have to take a quick break. I do want to encourage everyone to buy my new book, 101 Incorrect Mystic Pizza Trivia Questions, available wherever you buy books. But seriously, I have to take a quick break. I do want to thank everyone for their support of the sponsors. When you support the sponsors, you're supporting us here at Classic Conversations, and that's how we keep the lights on. And now back to my discussion with Ileana Douglas. We're going to talk a little De Niro. This is, and this is the location, location, location kind of section of the book. Uh, you co- you talk a lot about Robert De Niro. Mr. De Niro? Yes. Bobby? No, I'm Yes. <laughs> I don't know. Mr. De Niro. So he's done a bunch of movies. You've worked with, you wrote an essay from your first book on working with Mr. De Niro. Yes. Fear and, or two, you've worked with him twice. Yeah, of course. I mean, he's, you know, one of our greatest actors. So, uh, so thrilled, thrilled, of course, to to work with him, and uh, and it was fun to be able to write about him. I used the two primary films I talked about of his that he made in Connecticut were uh, Stanley and Iris, which was made in Waterbury, and then a movie called Jackknife, which was filmed primarily in Meriden and Cromwell, but some other towns around. And they're very blue collar, kind of industrial films, and it's really to talk about the industrial sort of part of Connecticut. And what I liked about his performance, especially in um, Stanley and Iris, but also a little bit in Jackknife, is that there's, you know, there's two kinds of, I mean, I don't want to say there's two kinds, obviously he's done such a variety of films, but what he's known for is these kind of larger than life, you know, Capone, Goodfellas. But then there are these other films that he did, Awakening, Stanley and Iris, Jackknife, where he plays a character that almost that is very clumsy, not very literate, doesn't have a 
great ability to speak well, can't communicate well. Though, And for me, because I believe the first time I saw Robert De Niro on screen, which I write about, was in a movie called Bang the Drum Slowly. And I was so affected by it. I watched it at drive-in. I was like, oh my God, it's the saddest movie I've ever seen. And uh, so I wrote about it from that you know, perspective. That's always been you know, I started out as a wanted to be an actor, but I'm a fan of I was all, I'm a movie fan first. So I saw these people in movies and looked up to them and admired them. And then in some instances, I was lucky enough to work with them, get to know them in a certain way. And so when I write about them, it, it's a little bit from both the perspective of working with them, getting to know them a little bit, and then maybe seeing something in them that has not been pointed out, that is not the more obvious Thing. And so what I loved about Stanley and Iris was what's so powerful to me was his inability to express himself and how I find it to be more, those are the my favorite performances of, of his because they seem truer to the person in some ways that I knew, you know, or worked with, shy, hard to communicate, yet bubbling up with a great, great deal of emotion. That's why I chose to write about it. And that's it's one of my favorite eff- essays, of course, is the Stanley, Stanley and Iris, you know. I just always like to write about, I mean, as I, you know, I'm repeating myself, but I just love actors so much. And I love movies. And I, you look through the catalog and as I'm writing the book, it wasn't my intention like, oh, okay, now I'm going to go off on the beaten path and write about Robert De Niro. But you just feel like, I don't know, I feel like it's my job sometimes to just do that. It's like, now I'd like to take a moment and write a little bit about an actor who is terrific and I admire and, and write, you know, again, writing about things that aren't the more obvious things that other people write about. I have other actors like that too. Believe me, I have them all in the back of my head that I like, I want to write, either write about them or interview them. There's certain other people that I really admire. I got to do that a little bit with Jane Fonda because I idolized Jane Fonda, you know, growing up. First of all, she was in every movie I ever saw like in, in my age group. It was like, and now another Jane Fonda movie. So there was always that, like there was that comfort of seeing a Jane Fonda movie. She was always in the movies, you know, like George Siegel or somebody. And then I got to interview her twice and that was really great. So it was like years of watching her and then getting to interview her a couple times was just really great. And I'm doing it as a public service for other people so that they can discover other aspects of her. And I wrote about her quite a bit in Stanley and Iris, too, of how her performance must have shifted because she, you know, she signs on to do this movie, well-meaning movie, teaching this guy how to read. And then they decide to shoot it in Waterbury and all these veterans came out of the woodwork and they wanted to stop her filming, which I never knew this whole story. And it happened in Connecticut. Like there was a lot of anti-Jane Fonda feeling in Connecticut. And it really surprised me because I always thought of Connecticut as being somewhat liberal, but no, they were, they were really vehemently against her. And she did a lot of listening sessions and raised money for the veterans. And so I wrote about that again, from that perspective, how did that I mean, she was picketed while they were shoot, shooting the movie and people outside, like she's doing a, a movie and they're booing her, you know, and picketing her, telling her to go home. And that really surprised me that people, you know, did that. But I wondered how, again, an experience like that affected her, her acting. When we met, we were talking about Clute, but I was telling her at the time, I said, you know, if they ever do a Stanley and Iris criterion, I just would absolutely love to talk to you about it. And she writes a little bit about it in her book, but it was a big shift for her because the Hanoi Jane, you know, label that she got had its resurgence when she went to do Stanley and Iris. Mm. And I found that to be, again, very, very interesting. And, you know, it's a stain on I think it's, you know, to stain on, on Connecticut, obviously it was very complicated. And, but the fact that she took the time and listened to the veterans and it, it turned out to be okay. And they made the movie out of it. I just thought, wow, this is such a layered, all these things went on behind the scenes in this movie. So that was a fun one to really write about. Wow. 
when you meet someone like Jane Fonda, or is there someone where you kind of like, you need a minute? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, I can't believe I'm sitting yeah. here, right? Like, because you've, inter- you've interviewed some really great people. I, I was watching, uh, there was a clip I saw you with Jerry Lewis and big names. You don't mess around. <laughs> well, I just, I admire these people so much. I've been watching them all my life. You know, I'm not just someone who says, okay, I'm going to have two days of prep and an assistant give me some notes about this person. I've been watching them since I was a kid and formulating my own opinions about them, studying them, you know, because I'm an actor and I love watching other actors. That's probably a different perspective. You know, I always use the Richard Dreyfus example because I watched him so much as a kid and then I got to act in a movie with him and then I got to interview him later on. So I had every perspective of being able to in- interview him as both an insider and an outsider. I watched him on screen, then I watched him off camera, you know, and then now I'm interviewing him. So I don't ever have a the instinct that some people, that some interviewers have to, to have a gotcha moment is just not my thing. You know, there may be, if I don't like something, I just sort of keep it to myself. It's just not, I don't know. I, it's so hard so hard to act in a movie, make a movie, get a movie out that I just don't, I can't in good conscience, even when I want to write or say something negative publicly about a film. I just can't. And I feel lately today, it's so easy for people to just be critical or dismissive. And it's just not helpful. I wish we thought more of artists. And that's why I write books the way I do. It's just like, okay, now it's a book. It's here forever. Let's take a second look at this film that got overlooked, or let's take a different look at this, at this actor. It's a reminder of all these great people. And I wish our culture, I wish we honored you know, people in the arts a little bit, a little bit more. And hopefully again, the book will be that kind of a a blueprint that people will say, you know, I want to go back to Connecticut and make more movies with me in them. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously with you in them. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't be a Connecticut <laughs> movie without you in it. No, I agree with that point of view. I think people like to hear stories. They want to hear the history. They want to hear, they just want to hear, they, they, they just like hearing it from the person that you're talking to as well, I think. You know, just a kind of firsthand account of things from people they grew up watching, listening to, admiring. and yeah. Uh, if you give someone context, I think it's the movie becomes a little bit more enjoyable. It's very easy to just dismiss it as like, oh, Mystic Pizza. Yeah, it's chick flick from the 80s. I don't want to. But, you know, when you rewatch the movie and as I did, you know, it's filled with all sorts of great surprises. You know, you don't you don't see there are no, no female bonding movies like mystic pizza done i well, i can't remember when the last female bonding movie i saw and it's not bad like when you want you know when you watch the movie you're like it's a really good movie these ideas like are they're, they're good it's about these women coming out of school and they really don't know what they're going to do with their lives one girl is really smart but she doesn't have enough money to go to yale and then one girl's really pretty and doesn't think she's very smart, so she relies on her looks. And uh, one girl just is very satisfied to just kind of, you know, run a pizzeria and, like, has no aspirations, wants to, you know, live and die in the town she grew up in. And then all these ideas as you're re-watching it, you're like, they should be making more movies like this, you know, because it gives you an avenue to um, to talk about. No, I agree with you a hundred percent. They could always do a sequel where she made a, a bazillion billion dollars on a slice of heaven merch. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I did have a question. I was uh, uh, who uh, was uh, crazier to work with, Buddy Hackett or Jiminy Glick? Oh, geez, that's tough. <laughs> Probably Buddy, but I I had a strange in with Buddy Hackett, which he reminded me of. I knew Buddy Hackett, of course, from you know, watching him on Hollywood Squares and on The Tonight Show. But he reminded me that when I met him, he'd actually worked with my grandfather. Uh, My grandfather produced a show called Call Me Mister, which they found 
talented, you know, pe- this was in the arm, you know, when they were in the army and people, you know, were in the army that were still were comedians and singers and dancers and things like that. So he was in, he was w- part of that troop of, um, from Call Me Mister. So he knew, he knew him previously. So he was always pretty, you know, pretty, pretty nice to me, but, you know, because he was, he was older, you know, there was limited, limited in terms of, you know, the time, time he could work and, and, so that meant, you know, that would make it problematic. And he was way out of sync, obviously, with the current time. So he didn't think it was, you know, bad to come up and grab you and <laughs> do all sorts of things you'd probably be arrested for now. But that was Buddy. Buddy Hackett's hilarious. Martin Short is Jiminy Glick interviewing you. <laughs> yeah, he's a genius. Martin Short is a genius as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, that was that was just as much of an honor for me as to be in Cape Fear because I idolize comedians anyway. And so some of these people that I've worked with, you know, whether it's Gary Shanley, even briefly, and Mar- Martin Short had done a television show, which I think I was on a short-lived talk show. So I got to be on his talk show, but I was just such a fan of of Martin Short. So to be on Jiminy Glick was, uh, was really, yeah, it was an honor. Totally kidding. That character is so funny. <laughs> it was it was really funny. Um, and then I was excited to see that you worked with Kevin Bacon because now that means I'm just you know oh and Jeff Duoskin and yeah. Ileana. He's another terrific guy. He's he would be one of those people I'd love to have an excuse to write about Kevin Bacon because I just he's such a terrific actor and he's done so many great things. Just terrific. It's like you can't imagine. You're like, wait a minute, he's never won an Oscar. How's that possible? Terrific person, interesting person, versatile, and uh, would absolutely love to work with him again. Work with him twice, and I, I and I also loved him. You know what I mean? In movies, he's another example. He's in Diner, and now we're doing a movie with Kevin. Bacon. I always have like I'm just as excited to have the bucket list of. I saw him in a movie and now I'm acting in a movie. It still sort of really gets me excited. Even more exciting in Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, you're you're a direct connection. That's true. I guess so. Within the culture. I don't, although I don't really understand it, but I guess it's good. Yeah. <laughs> was there any, what was the one movie um, that you discovered while you were doing your research that maybe you had kind of forgotten about and rediscovered? And Oh boy. I mean, there's so many even just right off the top of my head, rewatching Amistad and realizing how much, how important it is in terms of Connecticut. And I think the movie, again, is, you know, it's got some problems in it. Some of the casting is maybe not great, but it's, you know, but it's, it's Spielberg. And the one note that I make in the movie is, could he be criticized for sort of disney events that occurred? Possibly. But yet he's such a master filmmaker. Doesn't mean that somebody else can't tackle the same subject. And I really, that one of the things of the book is Amistad is, was so much larger story. Again, you know, growing up here, you hear about Amistad, but I didn't really know. I'm like, okay, Amistad. And there's, yes, I know we did something, the case, the case of Amistad and the slaves that were here and how they were eventually freed. But as I read more and more about the story, I was like, oh my God, this should have been a miniseries. There's just, there was so much more to it. Spielberg decided, I guess, for action reasons to concentrate most of it on the trial. And what was more interesting was was to me good and bad how the people of the abolitionists of Connecticut both were terrific in that they you know helped eventually free the slaves but on the other hand were really exploited the slaves they charged people money to and none of that is in the movie you know they to show like look at how bad this is here a nickel to come in and Take a gander. So, you know, wealthy women, you know, it was like a sport or, you know, it's just awful. You know, imagine exploiting these poor people that are that are here, but for a good what they thought was a good cause. What's also not explored is that they the men were they kept the men in prison, but the women stayed in various houses around New Haven. Now, that to me is another like, whoa, whoa, like that's another whole movie. They were, you know, taking in these people didn't you know, landed somehow in Connecticut 
and now you're living in this house with these people who were are and you're you know they they think they're doing something good but who the hell knows anyway it was it's so la- it was so layered both good and bad and a more nuanced movie could be made about Amistad however the power of the film and of the message of the film does retain and so in that sense i really i like watching it and of course and all the acting is unbelievable morgan freeman is terrific and anthony hopkins that's a complicated film for me complicated the one movie that i stumbled on that i thought was really interesting was remade as the money pit with tom hanks and shelly long but mr right. blandings builds his dream house uh, yes. which also starred a two-time academy award winning actor melvin douglas any relation kidding Yes, yes, your grandpa uh, and Cary Grant. And I ended up Googling and I was like, I guess there's at least at least one that I could find of these houses. I guess they built 70 of them. Yeah, throughout the United States. Right. Yeah, so there's at least one in Omaha, Nebraska still. Well, there's four in Connecticut. I photographed two of them for the book and they are complete replicas of what was built in the movie. So again, that is something that is really important. It's a sort of a cornerstone of the book. Because again, it, it's this, you know, this myth of suburbia told through, you know, made in, made in Hollywood, but the original story by Eric Hodgins is Connecticut story. It happened in Connecticut and the producer was his neighbor, Dory Sherry. And, and so that is like Connecticut through and through to me. Plus it's just a hysterically funny movie. Your tidbit in the book about GE, General Electric, not being happy with that yes. kind of place. I didn't, I didn't, you don't think product placement in the late 1940s. No, the movie was wall-to-wall product placement. Yeah. It was one of the first films that I really could discover that had that much product placement in it. Everything in the, in the movie, all the appliances, et cetera. Cary Grant's driving a Ford. In fact, there's a scene where I remember watching the movie and like, Hey, why are they driving? Like, there's a lot of driving shots in this movie. And, oh, it's because it's product placement, you know. But it's the selling of America. And the idea of the movie is, you know, just keep spending and spending and spending. And somehow it'll all work out. And that's where, that's where we are today. And so I thought, well, that's really interesting. Because, again, this myth of suburbia, it's not Ohio or New York or you know, anywhere else, it's Connecticut. That's where they chose this idea of superior living in suburbia is Connecticut. And so Connecticut, therefore, must be recognized. Is it, is it, are we to blame? You know, because the movie created this myth of suburbia. Well, I like to think of it, it's real and it's the dream. And I kind of, I can hear people right now, keep listening to the end. They're packing because they're already looking at Zillow's in uh, Connecticut. <laughs> they're heading yeah. off. You've done your yeah. job. You're going to fill up Connecticut. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. And this was, you're amazing to talk to. Uh, you had so much knowledge. And I know you were just scratching the surface of everything you know about these movies and stuff like that, but just fascinating. And the book is amazing. You're Thank amazing. You so much. Thank you. Well, I hope everybody, you know, it's good to read and it's good to read. There's, um, I think there's a movie, you know, really for everybody. Again, I didn't want to not have horror movies in there. I just, I tried to hit every, there's even a religious film. <laughs> <laughs> I even found a religious film, which is called Come to the Stable, based on a completely true story of these nuns coming to Bethlehem and and building an abbey uh, here. And uh, it's where Sister Dolores Hart, who's the famous nun that turned her back on showbiz. She did a movie with Elvis, turned her back on show business, became a nun. Guess where she lives? Connecticut. It's got all the, I, as I said, try to have a movie for everybody. Catherine Hepburn, the Sherlock Holmes stuff in the book. I know. Um, there's So much. It's all in one book. Connecticut in the movies. I always wanted to do like a throwback coffee table book. I grew up with, co- you know, I, I'm like, the coffee table book needs a comeback, don't you think? It does. Bert Lancaster and from The Swimmer on the cover. Can't no, go no. wrong. You'll be the, the, you'll be the hit of the party when they come to your house and see Connecticut in the movies. Yes. Okay. So speaking of Connecticut, now I got, now I got to put on my other hat and actually work on my, do some Connecticut things, some real Connecticut things around the house. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all the stories. It's all so fun. Appreciate it. Thanks. You have a great day. You too.
Bye. All right. How amazing was Ileana Douglas? So great. Nobody knows movies more than her. I tell you, you got to get her book, Connecticut in the Movies, from Dream Houses to Dark Suburbia. You can get it on Amazon or wherever you buy books. If you love deep dive into movies, especially classics, really across the board, uh, this book is for you. Well, with the interview over, it can only mean one thing. I know. Another episode has come to an end. One more huge thanks to my guest, Ileana Douglas. Another huge thanks to all of you for coming back week after week. It means the world to me, and I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Classic Conversations. If you like what you heard, don't be shy and give us a follow on your favorite podcast app. Also, why not go ahead and tell all your friends about the show? You strike us as the kind of person that people listen to. Thanks in advance for spreading the word, and we'll catch you next time on Classic Conversations. Classic Conversations.